Hi, this is National Master Dan Heisman, and I'm here to talk about forward chess and some of my chess books here, in particular the world's most instructive amateur game book. Forward Chess is an app that you can get on your mobile device. I have it on my iPad. And you can also get it on the PC. And what we're looking at here on the screen is the app for the PC. You can just download it. If you have Windows 10, uh, you can download the app. And when you get the app, it'll have several things inside the app. For instance, here's the store and different publishers. I actually have three different publishers who publish books of mine that are on Forward Chess. There's Russell Enterprises, uh, there is Everyman Chess, and we're going to look at a book that I have from Mongoose Press. So each one of the publishers, you can click on the publisher and see a whole bunch of books. If you want to see all publishers, there you can see there's literally hundreds of books that you can buy for Forward Chess. Okay, so that's the store. We're gonna go into the library. The library is books that I have, and you can see here that the first seven books in my library are all books that I was the author. So I have 12 books that I've written, and seven of the 12 are available right here on Forward Chess. Now, what, is a, what does a book chess app do? Well, a book chess app not only allows you to read the book like a Kindle would, but it makes the chess game come alive. It gives you an active board and it gives you the capability of doing other things like analysis. So let's get into my book, The World's Most Instructive Amateur Game Book. We'll double click on that. And over here on the right where it says content, we can see the table of contents. And let's go through that real quickly. We have Too Fast. Too Fast features games where at least one of the participants played faster than what they should have for the time limit and for the position. Too Slow features, again, at least one player who was playing much too slow for the kind of moves he needed to play, got into unnecessary time trouble. Endgame mishaps. Endgame mishaps, of course, are games where people did things that were not very good in the endgame and we could learn from them. A variety of instructive play, all kinds of different things to learn from is the fourth chapter. And the final chapter is Disaster Strikes, where one player is doing okay, and then all of a sudden, for some reason, which we talk about in the book, something really, really bad happens, and it all goes away. So those are the chapters in the book, and you can see the chapters. You can click on Stockfish 10, which means when you're looking at a position, you can analyze the position. You can click on openings, which means when you're in the opening part of the game, you have a database with the database information. Or you can search a game database for other games from a particular position or matching your position from the game. The book, of course, is here on the left. And right now I've clicked on Chapter 3, Endgame Mishaps. Um, and the main thing about the games here is they're alive. So if you click on a move, on the game, it's played on the board on the right automatically. You don't have to get out a board or find an electronic board. It's right there. And if you want to go to the next move, you can click on the move in the game. Or underneath the board, you can use these typical standard board arrows. The uh, left at, leftmost icon flips the board. The next one takes back a move. The next one goes forward to the next move. And the last one plays out the game automatically at a certain speed. Okay, so we'll put that on pause, turn that off. Okay, and you notice as the game was being played out over here, it kept track during the um, actual text as to what move it was on. So you can see that Forward Chess does a lot for you. It, it not only gives you the book, but it brings it alive, it enables you to analyze the position with an engine, look up the data opening in a database, um, just do all kinds of things. And you can see we have multiple tabs here at the top for multiple books that I have open. So what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about now about the book itself, which is the world's most instructive amateur game book. I've had a lot of people tell me, I don't want to buy this book because I don't want to see people putting their queen on prees. Well, I think there can 
they're confusing amateur with beginner. In the chess world, amateur means your rating is below master, below 2200. So even people who are expert levels are considered amateurs. When you go to the US amateur and, you know, play there, the top players are all expert level players. So, you know, amateur doesn't mean people are putting their pieces on prees. It just means that they're everyday people, the kind of people that normally buy chess books, the kind of tournament players that you see in most tournaments. So these are the kind of people who make more average mistakes, the mistakes that you can learn from. So I agree 100% that most of the games you should study from game books should be master games. And in fact, I tell people to read what I call instructive anthologies, where the author is actually trying to make you a better player like I do in this book. Um, it, they're written for instruction rather than a book like, you know, Karpov's Best Games, where he's trying to show you what, he, what happened in his best games. He's not really writing that book to try to teach you how to play chess better. But when you're playing over these annotated master games, you're looking, the reason you're playing mostly master games is you're trying to see what they're doing to do things right. So you see how they bring out their pieces, how they, you know, come up with their plans for the middle game, what the, how they play in the end game, what is their strategy, that kind of thing. And you, the more you see good people play, the more your brain says, oh, that's what I'm supposed to be doing. I'm supposed to be getting out all my pieces. I'm supposed to be getting my pawn majorities rolling. I'm supposed to be getting my rooks to the seventh rank, that kind of thing. So that's the most, what mostly you're supposed to be studying in game books. But a lot of people think they shouldn't study any amateur game books. And I think that's kind of crazy too, because in amateur games, people are making the mistakes that the, that the masters are not making. We're not talking about putting their queen on prees. We're talking about, you know, allowing, you know, not relatively intermediate level tactics, maybe playing the wrong strategy, maybe doing something like we talked about earlier about playing too fast for the situation or playing too slow and getting into unnecessary time trouble. We're talking about not coordinating their pieces right. We're talking about not developing their pieces right. These are the kind of things that if you play over amateur games and you have a good author, he'll tell you what they're doing wrong and what you can do to prevent those making those same kind of mistakes. But also it's telling you what you can do if your opponent makes those mistakes to take advantage of them. So you're learning about the things that you shouldn't do, how to avoid them, and how to take advantage of them when your opponent does them as well. These are all extremely helpful things to learn. And that's why I wrote a book like The World's Most Instructive Amateur Game Book. So hopefully, you know, if you purchase this book, and I think this is one of my very best books, you'll learn a lot about a lot of different things. So I thought maybe for the rest of the video today, we could look at the end game from one of the end game uh, games from the uh, end game chapter. So let's do that right here. Let's go back to the start of this game. And we'll play out the game fairly quickly till we get to the end game, and then we'll spend a little time on the end game just to kind of show you what forward chess can do and what buying this book can bring for you. So we're going to concentrate on the end game part, but during the whole game, I try to instruct you as well. All right, so D4, we're going to skip what I'm trying to instruct you. If you want to see what I'm trying to teach you out of the early part of the game, you know, obviously you can purchase the book. So we're just going to skip ahead. Oh, by the way, notice there when I went ahead, the computer gave me the choice of going through the sub line that he has or playing the move from the game. So when you're going through the game in, in forward chess, it not only has the game live, but it has some of the important sub variations live as well. So we'll go a little further. I'll click on the move from the game and I'll show you how you can click on the subline. So right now we're just clicking on the game. Pawn takes. Okay, again, it gives you alternative that shows why E takes D5 is bad over here. So here, if you click on the subline in the game, it's in blue rather than black. And that tells you that the moves are live meaning they can be clicked on and played on the board. And you don't have to try to visualize the subline or get out a second board. 
you can just click on the moves that could have been played. It says if e takes d5, knight c5, and if knight takes d5, knight takes d5, c takes d5, knight c5, and you can see the lines from the subline if you want to go back to the main line. Just click on the move from the main line, c takes d5, and we're back on the main line. Okay, so we click on the next move. Notice how it's scrolling down for me automatically. I don't have to scroll. Every time I click on the next move on the board, it goes to the next move over here. But you could do it over here as well. I could click back on knight h5, and I could click on bishop g5 over here. I could follow the game by reading and clicking on the next move, or I can follow by next move, next move, next move. Since we're not going through all the text that where I'm trying to teach you all this stuff for the game until we get to the end game, that's why I'm using the arrow under the board. But if I was really reading the book, I would probably be clicking on the moves over here on the right. Okay, so we're again, we're, we're just kind of quickly going through the early part of the game. I'm always taking the top move, which is the move from the game. We're trying to get to the end game. Okay. White has just lost the pawn. Black is trading off to get into the end game. Black says, let's trade some more. White says, I guess I have no choice. Otherwise, you'll come down. All right, I guess we could start going over a little bit of the game from here. So Black's in the end game now, and he has a knight and six pawns against a bishop and five pawns. And also white has doubled pawns and a very weak pawn on e6. So theoretically, if both sides play perfectly, we think black should be winning. So let's, let's ask Stockfish if that's true. So let's put Stockfish up here and we'll turn this button on the left, turns on the analysis. And we should see the numbers start to grow well past minus one if black's winning. And indeed, as Stockfish is looking deeper and deeper, it's now up to minus 2.5, minus 2.66. And I think he's going to have to look really far ahead to get like minus, you know, six or seven. But this is a really good indication that, that with best play here, Black should be winning. And it says that Black's best move is to play knight e5 check. And in the game, Black plays knight e5 check. Notice here, White cannot play bishop takes knight. Now there's a really, really super important principle that is don't trade down into a king and pawn endgame unless you're almost absolutely sure you're going to get what you want. So here, White's down a pawn, so he wouldn't take that knight and go into a king and pawn endgame unless he goes ahead and calculates and figures out, okay, if I play bishop takes knight, can I get, a, get my draw, or even better? You, you wouldn't do it on general principles. You wouldn't say, well, he checked me with a knight. If I take off his knight, I double his pawns too. That's got to be good for me, so I'll do that. I call that idea hand-waving. Hand-waving is fine if you're playing speed chess, but in slow chess, you need to figure this out. You need to figure out, if I take that knight, can I get a draw? Does it look like I might be drawing? And here it's pretty clear that if he takes the knight, that black's completely winning. For instance... Bishop takes e5 here, and you can see the number going up now, minus 4.4. Obviously, black has to take the take here. We'll, we'll take the bishop. And the number's climbing very quickly, minus 10. Black's just going to play king g7, king f6, king takes e6, come back to f6, break with g5, and win. He's probably got other ways of winning as well. White's king can't come up to f4 or g4 because the pawns are blocking him in, this would just be completely disastrous. So, if we go back to knight e5 check, so white plays the right move. He plays king f4, and now he's threatening to win the pawn, but that would still go into an endgame 
with equal pawns where white has the doubled isolated pawns. So even now, maybe bishop takes knight is not good for white even if it wins a pawn. Again, it would be hand-waving just to say, I can win a pawn, let's do it. What you have to do is figure out if I win that pawn, you know, who's winning the end game? And the answer is probably black. Okay, so here, black thinks for a while. Now we, we have the time stamping on the game and I think showing the time stamping is really, really important. That's why I have chapters called Too Fast and Too Slow. Here, white's already in some time trouble. He, he has an increment, I believe there's maybe a 45 second increment on this game. And white took about 45 seconds to play king f4, which he should. And black has 20 minutes left now. And he takes almost five minutes to play his next move, which is a really good move. It's Stockfish's number one move. He plays king f7 going into the, sorry, king g7 going into the pin and allowing white to win the, the, the pawn. He could have moved the knight, but black calculates that if white now wins that pawn, that he should probably be winning. He took five minutes. Did he calculate it very well? Well, as we'll see, maybe not. But he did do the right thing. He took the time to calculate. And I have a little thing in italics here, which I use italics in my books to, to give you general principles, something that you can remember that's outside the specific position of the game, but it's brought up by the position in the game. And my general principle I say after king g7 is, it's not what you trade that matters, but what's left on the board after you trade. Okay, so here, black is getting a bad trade. He's trading a knight and a pawn for a bishop. But what's left on the board after he trades is a winning position for black. So now white is between a rock and a hard place. He can win the pawn and go into a bad king and pawn endgame. Or he can not win the pawn and be in a totally lost endgame here. For instance, suppose he tries to play a move like uh, king to g5. Okay, the computer says he has nothing better. Black is going to wait with king to h7. And now white's getting close to Tsukzvang. For instance, he can't play bishop to d4 because of knight f3 check. But if he moves his king away, black will play king h6 and then play g5 check with a pseudo sacrifice and an easily winning position. So, and if white moves his queenside pawns, Black will also just waste time, let's say playing knight c6, waiting for, for the white king to run out of time or the bishop to have to move away. And the knight on c6 could even go to d8 and win the pawn on e6 with a hopeless position. So let's go back to the game, king g7. Okay, we click on that position. So white makes a, you know, rock versus hard place decision here. He decides he's going to take the pawn and see if black can figure out how to win. He figures it's pretty hopeless if he doesn't take the pawn. If he plays king g5, if he plays anything but king g5, black will play king f6 and then king takes e6 and he'll be up two pawns with a trivial win. So white decides to take the knight. Not because it's that good for him, but because everything else is even worse. Alright, obviously black has to take back and white has nothing better than to take the pawn. And now, if you look over in the, in the board here, I say, all right, without going further, and let's turn off Stockfish so we can have a little fun here. It says, before the position, it says, what would you play for black and what result would you expect? So this is very important. We not only want to know what move you're going to play, but what, it, what result of the game are you expecting if both sides play correctly here? If you're black, you know, are you playing for a win? If so, do you think you're winning? Okay, so you don't want to just find the best move you can. You also want to find out, you know, what are we playing for here? What, you know, if I'm playing for a win, I should reject lines that draw. If I'm playing for a draw, then I should accept lines that, that I find that draw. So you have to be very careful about making sure your expectations match what you're trying to do because if you try for something that the position doesn't call for, like let's say you're white here and you're trying to win, and you're rejecting all the lines that draw, and it turns out that you can draw with perfect play, then you're going to lose the game by rejecting all the draw lines. Okay, so anyway, here, king e5, what should black play? And the answer is he should play the move, I believe, king h6. Let's ask Stockfish now. Stockfish says, 
Yes, either play king h6 or first lock the queen side pawns with a, a5 or b5. Black correctly calculates that if he plays g5, that he can get the pawn back later and get the king out of the way, which is true. The problem is if white plays perfectly in that line, white can get a draw. So even though g5 is a major idea here, the right idea is to play king h6 first and then play g5. So let's take a look at that. The computer and the analysis in the game on the left will show you this. This, this is the board. Notice it says black to play after king f4 analysis, meaning that's not what happened in the game. So let's take a look. This is what should have happened. King h6, king f4, and now here's the trick. g5 check, h takes g5, king g6, and white's in Zugzwang here. He can't move his king to any squares and continue to guard the pawn on g5, and black's going to run him out of moves. So for instance, let's say white plays um, b4. Black can play b5. In fact, that's his only winning move. And now if white plays e5, now that the pawn's on e5 and white can, black can win both, all three pawns, black simply pushes the pawn to h4, king to g4, pawn to h3, king takes h3, king takes g5, king g3, king f5, king f3, king takes e5, king e3, he wins all three pawns, king e6, king here, king d6. Now, if this was a king and pawn against king endgame, white would have the opposition and be able to draw, but here, black has these extra pawns that he can win. For instance, king d4, e5 check, king e4, king e6, king e3, king d5, king d3, e4 check, king e3, king e5, king e2, king d4, king d2, and now black can just abandon his pawn. King c4, king e3, king b3, king takes e4, king takes a3, king d4, king takes b4, and wins. Okay, so that's all the kind of thing that we'd have here on the moves. I was just playing them out for you with stockfish, but same thing. So let's go back to the position in the game. Again, we can just click on king takes e5. Takes him a second to do that. Let's turn off stockfish so he's not thinking about that. So instead, black plays g5. And now if white plays perfectly, he can draw, but it's not so easy. So let's go through that. g5, h takes g. He's using that h pawn again to get the king out of the way. But here, he's down to tempo from the line we just looked at, and the pawn's not on e5. See here, the, the black king can't go to f5 and win both pawns. That makes the difference between the line we just looked at. All right, so black plays king f6. White plays king f4. King takes. Now it should be a draw. e5. King takes. Now black's threatening e6, winning himself, putting white into a zugzwang. So white has to play king f5, which he does. And now if black plays e6, then white will play king f6. So here, black should play some temporizing moves on the queen side. For instance, he should play b6 or a5 or even king d4 with an easy draw. Instead, he throws away the whole game by playing e6 check. And now, white can play king f6. The, 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 the structure we call with these two kings and the two pawns, we call the trebuchet setup. And here it's in mutual zugzwang. All black has to do now is, I mean, all white has to do is, is duplicate black's moves on the queen side and run them out of moves. So here black is in zugzwang and he plays a5. So the right way to play this for white, because you want black's king to be the first king to move, is to just keep playing the same moves as, as black played so that he has to move. And white has about six minutes to figure this out. All he has to do is make the same moves. So he tries, he takes three of his six minutes 
to try to figure this out, but he doesn't realize what's happening. He doesn't realize all he needs to do is keep symmetry here. And he does the exact opposite of what he needs to do. He plays just like black threw away the draw by playing e6 and now he's losing. White threw away the win and the draw by playing b4. And now black, is, if he moves the pawns correctly, is going to be able to force white to move. And he has a couple ways of doing this. He can play a takes b, a takes b, b5. Or he can do what he did in the game. He could play a4. And when white plays b5, he can play b6. This even keeps more pawns on the board. White has to move away from his e pawn. Black takes it. White goes after that b pawn. Here, black should not try to race with him. Black plays correctly king there. And after king, here, it would be a terrible mistake to push the pawn to e5. The correct thing to do, of course, is to stop white from taking anything and play king c5, which he did play. And now white realizes it's hopeless. He can't win any of black's pawns. And this e-pawn is going to promote in five moves. So white properly resigns. All right, so now we've got a chance to see uh, what forward chess can do for you. Hopefully we've also seen what my book, The World's Most, Instruct the World's Most Instructive Amateur Game Book, can do for you. A very, very instructive endgame. You know, it was instructed by the time management, instructed by the moves that they played and that they didn't play, what kind of mistakes they made. That's what I'm trying to teach you. And, you know, I try to um, give you some of these general advice too. Let's read the thing I have over here on the left, you know, where a lot of people think the faster you play, the smarter you are. You know, nothing could be further from the truth. You want to be really wise and take your time. So the principle I put in parentheses is rather than playing quickly to show how smart you are, take extra time on critical moves to make sure your analysis is correct, thus showing how wise you are. Yes, I have a lot of stories about that, about people thinking, gee, if somebody's taking a long time on an obvious move, they must be really dumb. Okay, so hopefully, well, let's go back to... Um, the store. We'll go back to my library. As you can see, I have my other books here. The guide, A Guide to Chess Improvement, Everyone's Second Chess Book, Is Your Move Safe? Back to Basics Tactics, The Improving Annotator, Looking for Trouble, and The World's Most Instructive Amateur Game Book. Those are all available here on Forward Chess. Um, if you enjoy my writing, you get a chance to buy seven of my 12 books right here. Um, hopefully you find my Games very my books very instructive. My one of my big goals from writing these books is I like to say things that you can't find in other books, with the with the possible exception of Back to Basics Tactics, where I have a lot of unique stuff, like a big chapter on counting and defensive tactics and things like that. With that, with the exception of that book, a lot of my other books I think are really quite unique things that you don't find in other books. Like for instance, the book above it is Your Move Safe. You know, how many books do you know where you're not trying to win your opponent's material, you're trying to see if your move wins or, sorry, sorry, if your move loses material or not. You're trying to figure out if your move is safe. You know, that's the idea of the book. Everyone's second chess book, a lot of good general advice and so on. Uh, looking for trouble is threats. I show positions where somebody moves. You have to list all the threats that they have, or at least all the important threats that they have, and then try to find, figure out the best ways that you can meet those threats. Okay, so for Forward Chess, for Mongoose Press, uh, this is Dan Heisman. Hopefully you enjoyed today's video. We'll see you next time. Thanks. Bye.